So let's let's simply start. I think so with a, with a, our next session with an extremely broad title, so <laughs> state of the art in climate impact research. But luckily, we have some very good people here to guide us today um, within this large area. And the first one is uh, Rupert Seidel from the University of uh, Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna with a talk on um, the impacts of climate change on forest ecosystems. Thank you. <laughs> thing working? Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm really, really glad to be here, and I'm really happy to opening this session on impacts. Thanks also for those of you who found the way back here, back into the auditorium here from the coffee. I know it's hard competition, you know, forests, coffee, so, you know, to make your decision. So I'm happy to have you all back here. Um, and I will talk about climate impacts on forest ecosystems. And I thought since many of you are working in different systems, I start with a picture of uh, the forests of the earth. So where are they and how are they looking? So this, this is how the current distribution of forests on the earth looks like. And if you put numbers on it, uh, it's like 30% of the global land area are currently forested. And on those 30%, we have approximately 3 trillion trees. So that makes about 400 trees for each human being that we have on the planet. So each one of us, for each one of us, there's 400 trees out there in our forests. Now, these forests are pretty amazing systems. Uh, and one reason is that on 30% of the land area, they're uh, harboring 75% of the known terrestrial biodiversity. So 75%, three-fourths of all the taxa that we know currently off on terrestrial uh, land is in forests. And you can imagine that simply by their uh, uh, prevalence on the globe and by the biodiversity they harbor, uh, our forests have quite a big uh, uh, importance for uh, the sustainable development goals and for uh, human well-being, so for the ecosystem services that we draw uh, um, for, um, for our human well-being. And I want to highlight this with just uh, briefly mentioning two examples. And one is uh, a climate regulation, which is on, on, the, on the lower left corner there. And uh, forests are taking up a lot of carbon. And you see basically the, the vegetation and the, the autotrophic organisms uh, here in a diurnal circle taking up uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And there is estimates that show that uh, over the last years, forests have been cumulatively taking up between 30 to 60 percent of the anthropogenic uh, carbon emissions. So the message here is, if, if it weren't for our vegetation and if it weren't for our ecosystems, uh, the effects of climate change would already be much, much more severe uh, uh, than we are seeing them already now. Now, the other example that I want to highlight in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals is up on the upper right corner, and that's the provisioning of clean water. I mean, arguably, and we've heard a lot about human health already, clean water is very, very important for us as humans. And there's estimates that currently, uh, looking at the freshwater supply, about 75% of the global freshwater supply comes from forested watersheds. So forest is forest really being pivotal in, in, uh, uh, for, our, um, for, the, for the achievement of our sustainable development goals. Now, but forests are impacted by climate change, and this is what I will be talking about in my talk here today. And I would argue that forests are particularly at risk from climate for two major reasons. One is trees are very long-lived organisms. So the potential for genetic adaptation, for adaptation through evolutionary processes, is very, very limited. The trees live hundreds of years, so when we think of our climate projections, you know, evolutionary uh, adaptation is really limited. And the second reason is trees are firmly rooted to the ground, so they cannot run away. They cannot find better habitat. They're just there. And so I want to briefly highlight uh, um, um, impacts of climate change, and I want to bin this into three boxes. And they are the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'll start with the good. Uh, because there are actually uh, climate impacts that are uh, positive for our forests. And we see those particularly when we focus on uh, uh, tree growth. 
what we're seeing when we look at tree growth from the past is that trees are growing better today than they did in the past. And climate change plays a role here. There's uh, mainly two effects going on. One is CO2 fertilization. So having more CO2 in the atmosphere helps uh, plants in general. And the other thing is forests in many parts of the world grow in temperature limited areas. So uh, uh, warmer temperatures mean longer growing seasons, mean better forest growth. There are, of course, other factors, but I want to illustrate with an example from Central Europe. And I'm choosing Central Europe here because it's an area where we have studied tree growth for at least 150 years. So we have good longitudinal data on changes in tree growth. And this is a little bit of a noisy figure, but I'll walk you through it. What it's basically about is uh, it's about how trees grow in diameter. And I want to walk you through with an example of how long it takes for trees to be 20 centimeters in diameter. So that cross section that you see there, uh, and I've uh, indicated with this orange horizontal line here, a 20 centimeter mark. So if you were a tree that grew around 1900, it took you about 56 years to grow to a diameter of 20 centimeters. Now, if you're a tree that grows today, uh, it takes you only 41 years to reach the exact same diameter. So um, based on those data, we can show that uh, trees today, at least in this part of the world, grow between 32 and 77% uh, faster than they did still 100 years ago. Now, why is this important? Remember that we have three trillion of these trees on our globe. So what those three trillion trees growing better means they take up more carbon. And what it leads to is what you see on this figure here. So the dashed line going up is the carbon emissions, the anthropogenic carbon emissions. And the, the gray line on the bottom and the, the colored, the colored li trend lines that you see indicate how much of this carbon is staying in the atmosphere. And what you see is first it goes up and then it levels off and even uh, indicates a little bit of a downward trend. So through increased tree growth, through increased activity of the vegetation, we also call it the terrestrial carbon sink. So through an increase in that terrestrial carbon sink, we actually uh, see that less of our emitted carbon stays in the atmosphere. And that's good news for the climate. Now this has been the past perspective. So the question is, what about the future? And these are simulation results that were actually done here at PIC by my colleague Christopher Ryer. And they show for Europe, so these are different ecozones in Europe, going from the north all the way to the left, to the south and the right, that trees will continue to uh, uh, grow better in the future. So this is projections for the 21st century, uh, over 18 different climate scenarios, so a wide range, but you see they're growing better. Um, there's a little caveat here because um, I told you about CO2 fertilization, we are not exactly sure whether, that, whether this effect will persist. So we know that vegetation has this thing that adapts to changing conditions. So if you consider a down regulation, you see that the, the, the boxes are going down. But the bottom line is, with regard to tree growth, uh, the future is probably looking not too bad even on the climate change. But of course, there's a flip side to this, and this is what I'll bin as the bad part. And this is, now we've been looking at growth of trees, uh, but of course there's also tree mortality to be considered. And tree mortality, uh, as mortality of humans, we'll certainly be hearing more about, is quite of an intricate uh, process, but it's linked to climate. And if we follow trees, so this is a longitudinal study where we've been following the fate of 230,000 trees distributed all over Europe uh, for quite a while. So it's more than 1 million data points. And if we follow trees, what we see is that warming summer temperatures, particularly summer maximum temperatures, uh, increase tree mortality risk. And this is what you see on the left here. So a year that where the summer maxima are 3 degrees warmer mean about 40% increase in mortality. Now, interestingly, though, uh, if we look at winter temperatures and uh, cold temperatures in winter, uh, warming temperatures in winter uh, mean decreased mortality. So we see some comp compensatory effects there. Uh, we might see more uh, temperature-related more temperature mortality in summer, but less temperature-related mortality in winter. One thing that we are pretty certain about, though, are uh, uh, an increase in abrupt uh, climate-related mortality events from trees. And those can be come about by things like fire, uh, insect outbreaks, or also windstorms. Uh, you might have heard about the big fires going on in California right now. What you see here is observational data from Europe, so continental Europe. And over the last 40 years, we've seen these mortality events go up drastically. So about a threefold increase over the last 40 years. 
Um, and if you're like me, if you see those kind of hockey stick figures, you might ask yourself, well, how is this going to continue in the future? You know, so how, how will these mortality events change in the future? So we asked the question and we went back to the literature and we, we, we looked at all the information that we could find, you know, analyzing several hundreds of papers. And in the end, what we, what we found is under continued climate warming, the, there's high likelihood that we're going to see more of those pulses of tree mortality. Uh, and you see that, uh, you, we see that effect all over the biomes, so all the, way, all the way from the boreal forest to the tropical forest. Uh, there is uh, an increase when we look into the future in these pulses of tree mortality. Now, you might say, well, if this is the, the bad, what's the ugly? And I would want to make that point, I mean, this is a meeting where we're interested in the effects of climate change, but certainly there is a, a large number of global change drivers out there happening simultaneously, and I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with this figure here, which sort of is a horizon scan on our global problems uh, that we're currently facing, and climate change only being one of them. And I would argue that the ugly part that we might be facing is when drivers of global change here uh, start interacting and I, I want to give you an example of such an interaction with uh, how uh, a loss in, in the integrity of the biosphere and climate change are interacting. Now, what do I mean with integrity of the biosphere? Uh, I have another one of these hockey stick figures. And what you see on this one now, it's again time on the, on the uh, x-axis. And on the y-axis, you have intro introduction of species. So we're basically shifting species around uh, all across the world. Uh, deliberately or uh, not deliberately, where species just hitchhike on, with global trade routes. Now this distribution of species means that we're also distributing pest species and diseases. And this is particularly uh, detrimental for trees because then we have pests and trees that are not, that not have co-evolved over a long time and have, where trees not have uh, evolved uh, adaptive mechanisms. And I'll show you an example of two here that are important for pine species, which is a widely distributed tree species, so a nematode and the, and the fungus. And uh, those uh, are already present in Europe, but on a very limited area. So we looked at how can they spread given climate change. And what we found is that they can spread massively in Europe if we factor in the effect of climate change. So we have an, a massive interaction here between the effects of climate and the effects of the changes in our uh, biosphere through uh, invasive alien species. So with that, I'm already at the end. Uh, and I want to say that forests will also in the future continue to play a very important role in our biosphere and will play a very important role for uh, human well-being and the achievement of our development goals. And the effects that climate change will have on forests will vary. And there's positive effects uh, like increased tree growth, but there's also negative effects like changes in tree mortality. And then we might see unexpected interactions between different global change drivers. And with that, my time's up. I'm at the end of my talk, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the excellent presentation. We have time for four minutes ex uh, exactly for some questions. So. Thank you. So when we think and talk trees, we're mostly thinking over ground. But another fascinating side of trees is the underground, the soil. Can you say a little bit more what we know on how the growth underground uh, will respond? Yeah, this is a very, very good point. Uh, thank you for, for raising that point. So well, one thing that we're, that we're expecting is as trees get more stressed, one of their adaptation mechanisms is that they're starting to invest more carbon into below ground growth, like root growth. That's an adaptation mechanism. For instance, if you're water limited, you want to grab more water, you want to be more efficient. Um, we're still struggling a little bit, so another important part is uh, trees have a, an association with mycorrhizal fungi on the ground. So this is a very important part, also a very important part of the carbon cycle. And um, I'd say as a forester, we have a tendency to study the Yova story a lot. Uh, we're, we're currently trying to understand these, and I'm probably not the right person to, to, to give it up. But there's a lot, of, a lot of knowledge coming online on that. We've recently, for instance, learned that trees actually can communicate on the ground by, by root connection. So communication in that case means there's really carbon transfer between trees and the forest, which we haven't thought possible before. So it's quite an interesting story also going on uh, under the surface. Thanks for mentioning that. Time for one further question, I think. 
There's one in the back there. Yeah. Um, thank you for interesting presentation. Um, there are some countries, uh, for example, China, uh, now making an effort to make afforestation on abundant agricultural lands in order to alleviate problems of climate change and pollution. Uh, what is your estimate in the long run? Do you think that afforestation, uh, long, uh, big afforestation can help or not? You mean can help in terms of the effect of climate change? Yes. Or So I, I think, so forests will play a role and afforestation has an effect. Uh, so there is, an, and we see this already in areas where the forest area is increasing, which is mostly uh, uh, not the tropics, but the temperate and porous zone. So that there is an effect of increasing forest area. Um, unfortunately, I also think it will not, so forests will not be able to solve our climate problem entirely. So they will, they will make a contribution, but uh, all the afforestation will not solve our climate problems. The other thing to note is I think it's important to, to keep in mind the broad effect that forests have that go beyond climate. So there's, there's a lot of benefits from afforestation programs in places uh, like China, for instance, with regard to soil erosion, so stabilizing the soil, uh, creating a, a better microclimate. So there's effects that go beyond the, the effect on the global climate here. Okay, thank you. So the next. <laughs> next presentation is from William Chung from the University of British Columbia on the impacts of climate change on marine ecosystems and fisheries. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to come to speak in this conference. So now we are moving from forests to the oceans, and particularly I will focus on an, one aspect of the ocean, which is uh, the ability of the oceans to provide seafood for us. The demand for seafood from the ocean is uh, ever increasing. Uh, this is uh, a report uh, from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization that shows that uh, last year they have the record high estimate average per capita demand for seafood in the world. And with increasing population and growing wealth of the uh, society, it is expected that this demand will continue to increase. However, the ability of the oceans to provide seafood for us is not unlimited, and in fact, it seems that we have already reached the maximum capacity of the ocean in providing seafood. This is the figures showing the productions of seafood from capture fisheries, as well as from mariculture or marine aquacultures since the 1950s. You will notice that by mid-1990s, uh, we have already reached the maximum productions of come from capture fisheries at around 120 million tons. And since then, fisheries catches start to decline, even though fishing efforts continue to increase. In fact, this is a key sign of overfishing. The rapid expansions of marine agriculture fill in some of the gaps of the decrease in catch, making global seafood production from both agriculture and seafood production, from fisheries productions uh, almost uh, stable uh, since the 1990s. But in fact, we know that um, there are substantial amounts of fish stocks right now that are considered to be overexploited. And as you have heard from the panelist speaker early this morning, the ocean is facing a lot of different threats from human activities. Uh, overfishing is just one problem. And on top of that, we know that the ocean condition is changing. The ocean is warming up, it is more acidic, getting more acidic, um, the oxygen content is decreasing, sea level is rising, and all of this is driven by uh, human uh, emissions of carbon dioxide. And we know these changes will affect marine ecosystems and fish stocks. And one of the key examples of the effects of these multiple stresses affecting fisheries and the ecosystem is coral reefs, where with uh, extreme heat events, uh, overfishing, pollution, habitat destruction, it is actually eroding the ability of the coral reefs to produce sea uh, seafood. The, uh, with the increasing ecological footprints of um, the uh, fisheries on coral reef ecosystems, um, the fish stock is decreasing, uh, coral coverage uh, in the world is estimated to be only half of the historical baseline, um, and fisheries catch is starting to decrease in recent decades. So the, one of the challenges for us 
for communities is to understand what the future oceans would be and how much seafood it can provide to us, whether we can still sustainably enjoy seafood from the oceans without damaging the marine ecosystems under a changing ocean. And to do that, I argue that the community needs to take into account uh, multiple dimensions and domains of the whole ocean's uh, human natural ecosystems. We need to understand how climate change will affect living marine resources. Over the last couple of decades, we have gained tremendous knowledge about the, detect, uh, the observed and attributed effects of changing oceans uh, on the effects of fish stocks and fishery production. But then it's not enough. We need to understand how that interacts with the economics, the economic sectors, particularly in fishing sector or aquaculture sectors, how they interact with the seafood market, global demand for seafood and supply and also how that affects the one dimension of well-being of coastal communities, particularly using seafood as a source of nutrients and food, how that affects and interacts with the growing production of mariculture, and how it interacts with the broader changes of the society, human populations, changes in economic growth, and things like that. And our community is increasingly um, developing approaches to consider these um, human, coupled human and natural systems in a holistic way. One of the examples is the uh, initiative of uh, fisheries impact model intercomparison projects, where we have a, a big group of communities who are working on uh, models related to fishery resources and climate change, trying to uh, uh, aggregate their resources and knowledge in order to make better projections about future changes in fish stocks and productions. And this, this presentation, uh, I will highlight some of the results from, from, from a particular models from these uh, set of models. One of the things that we gain uh, over the years about how climate change will affect fisheries is that with global warming uh, and changing oceans, we may expect to see a decrease in global fisheries production even further. For example, um, this is a study that looked at um, the projected changes in global fisheries productions under different global warming scenario. What we find is that uh, we may be seeing around a 3.4 million tons decrease in global fisheries catch per unit increase in atmospheric global warming temperature. And at the same time, because marine species are shifting their distributions under ocean warming, we are also increasingly seeing changes in species compositions in our fisheries catches, with an average of around 6.7% um, per degree Celsius of warming in terms of the changes in the species composition. And all of these changes are challenging um, the fishing sectors. So in this particular study, what we try to look at is um, linking the changes in fisheries catches to the income of fishermen. So we look at changes in fisheries catches, which is highlighted by the color on the sea, while the changes in the incomes of uh, fishermen in the countries is highlighted by the color uh, on land. What we find is that there are regional differences in terms of the impacts, particularly the major impacted area are the tropical areas and fishermen in the tropical area, where you may see more than 30% decrease in uh, global fisheries catches as well as land of value in those countries, while some of the high latitude countries particularly the developed countries, may gain as the resources moved into the northern area and as uh, productivity of the oceans increase. This is also challenging um, some of the coastal communities that are heavily dependent on seafood for their nutri nutrient. This is a study in collaborations with a team of colleagues who work on um, public health, particularly looking at the nutritional quality of seafood and how much different countries are dependent on fish as a source of nutrients, particularly micronutrients such as zinc, iron, omega-3 fatty acid. What we find is that, first of all, we identify a set of countries that, are, that, we, think, that we, we say it is uh, nutritionally vulnerable to a seafood decline, meaning that their, um, their, coastal popul their populations are heavily dependent on fish as a source of micronutrients, which is highlighted by the red color on the map. And we overlay that with our projected changes in fisheries catches in the oceans. And the scary thing is the two overlap with one another really closely with the area where there is, uh, we projected a decrease, large decrease in uh, fisheries catches, while uh, countries where um, they are heavily dependent on fish as a source of nutrient, meaning that uh, with climate change, these countries is going to even Increase in the, have an increase in the vulnerability um, in terms of malnutrition uh, from decrease in seafood. 
not only developing countries in the tropics are being affected, even there are communities, even in the developed countries, who are more vulnerable that can also be affected by the changes in fish stocks and fisheries um, under climate change. One of the vulnerable communities are indigenous people, those indigenous people that live on the coast who often have a much higher rate of consumption of seafood. Take the example of Calendar in British Columbia, where coastal First Nation communities are heavily dependent on fish for their nutrition as well as for their culture. And in this particular study, uh, we look at uh, some of the fishes that are particularly important for coastal First Nations in British Columbia and look at how they made changes under climate change. What we find is that majority of these species that are important for the First Nations, such as salmon, herring, they are all projected to decrease by 30 or even 50% under the business as usual scenario. And that's really challenging the nutritional health of these uh, coastal First Nations because uh, the alternative for them uh, is to uh, have uh, more nutrition, less nutritionally rich uh, supermarket food. People often say that uh, marine culture, culturing fish is the solution to all this problem. We can just produce more fish by culturing. However, um, marine culture that are currently taking place in the oceans are not uh, isolated from the effects of climate change. Mohammed, which is a, who is a PhD student, uh, student of mine, um, are looking at the effects of climate change on global mariculture productions. He identified um, the potential habitats that are suitable for mariculture for, uh, for uh, over 100 different species that are currently farmed around the world. And then he projects how these potential habitats uh, for mariculture may change over time. For example, um, this is um, the projected changes in um, the habitats suitable for mariculture production for Atlantic salmon in the world. And in this particular case study, it shows that globally, the available habitat suitable for farming salmon is going to shrink, uh, meaning that it may also affect the, um, lead to a decrease in potential production from these particular, uh, production from these particular species. And then the, the important thing is how all of these can interact with one another and what are the trade-offs in terms of uh, economic, uh, social, and um, ecological dimensions of sustainable development for the oceans. And one way to look at that is to look at uh, using an integrated assessment modeling framework together with uh, potential scenarios of changes in the society. And I'm illustrating an example of this for four different species uh, with very different kind of life history, biology, as well as economic use. And we look at uh, the three different dimensions of sustainable development. And what we find is that um, under two different scenarios, one is a sustainable scenario, another is a business as usual scenario, as specified by the shared socioeconomic pathways of the IPCC. With the sustainable scenarios, the society can enjoy much higher consumption of seafood. At the same time, they can generate much more um, jobs, biomass, as well as profits. So achieving much broader range of uh, sustainable objectives compared to a business as usual scenario with higher climate change, um, which will lead to a substantial loss of uh, biodiversity, uh, profitability, as well as jobs. And people cannot enjoy uh, as much seafood as we used to be. So now, with all of these, it is quite clear that um, there is uh, a pathway that we should take that we can achieve ocean sustainability. However, the challenge to us is what are the um, potential solutions that can allow us to engage in these pathways. And one aspect that we propose um, is uh, through a ocean solution wedges, which is uh, in parallel or borrowing from the idea of the climate wedges, where we believe that there's no single solutions that can solve this problem. We need a combination of solutions that are nature-based, technology-based, or that are based on developments of the society, uh, reducing equity and things like that, in order to um, achieve the full scope of ocean sustainability over time. And um, so I think um, this will be the future challenge of our communities, to develop the tools um, to better understand um, how these different solution pathways uh, may achieve that and what are the trade-offs and co-benefits associated with that. So with that, um, thank you very much. So again, there's uh, time for a few questions.
Uh, thanks, uh, Andy Haynes uh, from London. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. I wonder if you'd also looked at the health implications of the oceans, because uh, about uh, a billion people are dependent on seafood for their basic nutritional requirements. And many nutritional guidelines also emphasize the importance of omega-3 fatty acids, for example, mm. for cardiovascular prevention. Well, there aren't enough, probably enough fish in the sea to provide, mm. uh, for, to help 7 billion people attain those dietary guidelines. So trying to optimize the outcomes to include human health is an important, I think, objective of your work. And I wonder if you've considered how to do that. Yes, indeed. Um, we we have uh, we, our analysis have linked uh, to the um, a database on the nutritional supply um, of fish from different seafood products, uh, particularly the micronutrients like omega three fatty acids and and things. Um, and we are linking that to um, to uh, look at how much of that can. Um, supply nutrients to nutritional vulnerable communities, and particularly how climate change will affect that. So I agree. So one dimension of this, we can add the, new, add the health dimensions into this analysis, and that's actually what we are planning to do. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more question. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Productivity and, and yield um, in fisheries that you, that you used to say in the north that there will be more, more yield, more fisheries. Can you say how, how you link the two? You mean the, in the high latitude region? Yes. Um, so in many of the models, um, so it shows that um, there is an increase in productivity in the oceans. In the high latitude regions, the primary productivity is because of um, um, increased temperature, um, reduces reduction in sea ice, and, um, and increased light um, into the waters that increase pine productivities, although there are uncertainty associated with that. Um, also, uh, with um, increasing, uh, with reduction, reduction of sea ice, increase in temperature, it also provides a more suitable habitat for some, some of the fish stocks that are currently in the temperate area to move into the, um, the, the higher latitude regions. So as a result, um, that we will see more of the traditional fish stocks um, occurring in high latitude regions. And I think uh, one of the examples is in uh, the Barents Sea where you are seeing much more caught population now uh, in there. Um, and um, so that's kind of the mechanisms behind the projected increase in, uh, in the productivities um, in the maps that I showed. Yeah, I just find this link dangerous because it often has to do with uh, seafloor integrity, which is missing usually from mm. the models, and especially for cod and other fish, the benthic, uh, um, the seafloor integrity is a key figure, yes, and uh, yeah. is impacted very rapidly by, by new fisheries. Yes, yeah. So I think that's one aspect that the strength of the, uh, the fish meat uh, initiatives will be really useful in exploring these uh, different dimensions of um, uncertainties where different models would have different um, specifications about this uh, particular aspect of ecology. Um, and so we can explore what will be the range of projections that, um, that will be for particular regions. And um, so I think, I think that is um, a, a, one of the key advantages of uh, initiatives such as fish meat. Thank you. Thank for you. This insight. <laughs> Great. <laughs>
uh, with food security, um, with climate change for food security. And I also, of course, I will um, talk um, research from my new institute, TROPAX, Tropical Plant Production and Agricultural Systems Modeling. So what I will do, quickly go to, cha to the challenges, the agricultural challenge, a uh, very brief history of uh, crop modeling. Then I have to be uh, selective just to pick a few highlights from the work of ACMIP and Maxur, modeling potential crop impacts and then modeling adaptation options. Uh, I also touch upon a little bit on the crop modeling contributions to integrated assessments at the different levels. And finally, very importantly, the way forward, the way ahead. So, what interests us, you all know about the agricultural challenge and several speakers already have touched upon in, in the first session. So, we have, we have to increase uh, food production by 60 to 70 percent by 2050 through uh, uh, urbanization, dietary changes and of course population growth from now 7.6 billion to, to almost 10 billion. So, that, that's the big challenge. And so, food and nutrition security is in, in our center. And uh, the way or whether, where and how we achieve uh, food and nutrition security heavily affects the sustainable development goals. So especially directly, of course, is the sustainable development goal uh, two, that is uh, no hunger, but also three, good health. This morning we had a few talks on that. And of course also poverty, uh, Stefan Hargat mentioned it. And then of course, the way we do it, how we uh, manage our agroecosystems, of course, also affects um, almost all the other sustainable development goals, five, six, 13, of course, climate action, and so on. But then I also would like to remind you the dual role of uh, agriculture. So one is to be affected by climate change and to have to adapt, especially as we have heard to extremes, uh, shocks, climate shocks, that is what really matters. But then also, um, I have indicated here like the, the, um, the 2012 um, Midwest US uh, drought and the implications of that um, to buy from 20% from yield loss, price volatility, etc. But then on the other hand, of course, we are heavily affecting uh, climate change by methane emissions uh, from livestock, from rice production, uh, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, of course. And if we uh, continue, these are the recent projections, if we continue with the trend of dietary changes continues, it would mean, so if that goes unchecked, we have about 80% more greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Okay, brief history. Um, I always like to show this slide. Cynthia Rosenzweig is here, so the, she is responsible for, for the global analysis, global impacts of climate change and crop productivity made in 1994. Uh, I think with one model, a uh, doubling of CO2, and that was the picture. Temperate regions gain, tropical subtropical regions lose. Um, ten, uh, in 2010, we had much more climate models, impact models, a much higher detail in, in soil and climate information, but the picture is largely the same. So a few changes here in the Midwest of the US and Australia, a little bit uh, negative. So there has not happened too much in those 15 years between SA, the second assessment report of IPCC and the fourth <laughs> one. But then thereafter we had a sea change. We really, through the collaborative efforts of ACMIP and Maxur and also CCAFs, we have, uh, have had considerable progress and we gradually see that in, in, in the impact assessments. So there was a recent commentary, I mentioned it here by, by John Porter, who has also assessed that and um, 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 his, his commentary is on considering agriculture in IPCC assessments. So I will talk about these um, results from ACMIP. I will not talk to you about how a crop model uh, looks like. I just want to say so much uh, when I'm talking here of crop modeling, I'm in the first place talking about process-based crop simulation models that are capable to capture the interactions of genotype by environment, by management. They mostly work on a daily time step. 
you can modify the genotypes, the soil, the climate, future climate, the management options, and then you get a number of output variables. Inside, there are mathematical formulas, formulations of the processes and their interactions. So now I come to, the, to some highlights. Let's immediately go to um, um, 2011. The status was that we uh, wrote a, um, a review and which led to a commentary in Nature Climate Change, which was called Crop Climate Models Need an Overhaul. Because we had found, when we uh, looked at, um, I can maybe go to this, uh, when we had looked at eight different models for wheat in 49 growing seasons that some for, for the current climate, that some underestimate, some overestimate, but that, the, over, that the, the overall mean of those eight models is very close to these uh, observations. So we said there is something to do, there is something to improve in the models, and this led to a whole range of model intercomparisons and also improvement efforts. And this was then embraced by ACMIP, by ACMIP V, but also by ACMIP Rice and Mace. Here that gives you an example of uh, ACMIP wheat, showing then uh, with uh, 27 wheat models how after calibration the models uh, get better and better and meet the observed values here in different locations of the world. And uh, this is one example of uh, ensemble modeling. So what, what we then found is, we found this kind of relationship that uh, multi-models um, lead, match quite ve uh, well with observations, and then we embraced this um, multi-model ensemble approach, as has been done by the climate modeling community already for a long time, and we applied it. And here this is an example of, of acmip wheat by um, first with uh, 30 wheat models, and first they were calibrated with uh, field experiments, with artificial heating experiment, and then we looked at the effect of uh, local temperature change on wheat production globally. Uh, and it was found out with this model ensemble uh, that per degree increase in local temperature, we have a 6% uh, decrease in wheat production if no adaptation takes place. So, so this is just one of many examples. Uh, let's go to the extremes, which are very important. Um, I should move this out here. So, of course, crop models are good in many things. Now I don't get the red point out. Um, crop models are good in many things, uh, as you see on the right-hand side, like um, modeling photosynthesis, respiration, or phenology in the independence of temperature. But then... Um, when it comes to capturing extremes, they are less good. We have worked on this. We have mainly worked on uh, effect of heat shocks, on floret mortality, on leaf senescence, and so on, and we are quite much advanced on that now, especially in the ACMIP uh, network. Um, we have also worked on effects of water deficits, uh, stomatal conductance, uh, reduced leaf senescence. Also there, we are on the way to make improvements. And also, most recently, we have looked at the interactions of extremes, which has, which has been completely neglected. So, the interactions of drought and heat, so we consider transpirational cooling in our models. However, there are a lot of acroclimatic extremes which have a high economic importance, which we do not include. So, heavy rains, water logging, oxygen stress, or then also heavy rains, warm winters, or combinations of certain constellations of extremes that lead to heavy yield losses. For those, we are at the very beginning. Okay, I have to move on. We also have worked on adaptations. We have, for instance, developed the impact response surface method together with ACMIP and Maxur into what we now call adaptation response surface uh, method, which is basically, uh, you have a climatic sensitivity analysis, you have a response variable like crop yields, and then you make systematic variations in temperature precipitations, and you, you show it then as isolines. And an adaptation response surface is if you subtract an unadaptive, unadapted uh, technological innovation from an adapted one, from an adaptation, and then you get the uh, adaptation response surface in percent. Okay, we also have 
crop models uh, leave, uh, deliver input into uh, integrated models. Here um, we have Maxur regional pilots. We had five pilots in 2015. We have now more than 20 regional pilots where stakeholders are involved. And uh, important is to, of course, integrate uh, the information of crop models um, delivering various in indicators for farm level analysis and regional analysis. Now I uh, have to rush with the perspectives. I realize, so I also pick here, we have to do more measurements on systems we, we have not modeled yet. This is, for instance, an example on uh, cocoa agroforestry systems in, in Ghana, where, for instance, the El Nino uh, event in 2015-16 wiped out cocoa uh, in agroforestry systems because there was too much competition for water, the high temperatures and the drought, while the, while the other system uh, in the full sun uh, survived. So um, that is only possible if you do detailed measurements of microclimate, soil water, etc. We have looked, uh, we made a review on extremes and we saw there is much more, there is too much concentration on the same. So for instance, on the left hand side, uh, we have reviewed uh, over 20 years the studies, empirical studies of extremes. We see an enormous increase, but most concentrate on drought and heat, and all the other ones are neglected. The same, we have a focus on models, APSIM, DSAT are uh, at the lead, uh, and also for heat and drought, but not for other extremes. So we have to do more experiments on crops that we have not yet captured, like sorghum. We have to look at the different genotypes, at the variation in the genotypes, and uh, we have to look at the interactions of drought and heat and the interactions of different extremes. So I have to um, go, we do idiotyping, and I want to end actually with this slide, which just summarizes that we have to confront much more the observations that we make, statistical models with the process-based models, and where we see discrepancies, we have to start with an iterative cycle of getting more understanding through targeted experiments, model improvements, then only then we can scale up, we can target regions where we have problems, and then again we can look at technological innovations, how to solve that. Okay, I don't talk about the next one, and I want to um, announce that there will be an ACMIP meeting, the seventh annual workshop, uh, 24 to 26 April in Costa Rica. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. okay. So there's time for yeah. a question. <laughs> Here. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Raymond. One question about, you spoke a lot about the abiotic stress factors and the need to include interactions of abiotic stress factors in the models. What about including interaction between abiotic and biotic stress factors in crop models? Yeah, you, you really point to a very weak point um, in the models. Um, uh, in, we have only recently again revived the modeling of uh, pests and diseases and there will be actually a conference now, a Maxo conference in, in Paris a crop loss conference. Um, of course, you are right. Um, but we, have, we still have to also gain much more e experimentation and observations on the interactions of different abiotic stresses. And of course, then often you see that if there are one or more ab abiotic stresses uh, affecting uh, the crop, that then it opens the way for, for biotic stresses. This is really under-researched. I think we have to do a lot in the, in the future on, on that. Uh, and uh, again, my plea is a much stronger linkage of uh, modeling and experimentation, or you could say model development, uh, experimentation observations than we have done at the moment. So one further very short question and brief answer, please. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering what was the status on uh, an impact, which, an effect which is a bit, as a, a bit more history, which is a carbon effect, the CO2 effect. Is there any progress? It's a huge error margin, and yeah. it has been a long, solid topic. 
Well, again, I think it was in, in May last year that we initiated the workshop at the Adop Future uh, World uh, Adaptation in, in, in Rotterdam. And there was a workshop on uh, progress in modeling uh, the effects of elevated CO2. And um, we are more and more, especially ACMIP, is embracing the uh, and working with experimenters of free air uh, enrichment experiments. And so there is progress. But again, for the main crops, for maize, for wheat, uh, we much more need to do on other crops. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. So. Um, the next talk is by Karl Friedrich Schleuser from Climate Analytics, um, on a, and he will provide a cross-sector view on the impacts at 1.5 degrees of global warming compared to 2 degrees. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Katja. And uh, indeed, while my previous speakers have been basically talking about their sectoral impacts, I have the pleasure to say a little bit about that, how they actually relate to uh, our focal points of our risk assessments when it comes to climate impacts, which are long-term temperature targets. And I start with putting up the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement on the screen, which was actually agreed uh, just 23 months ago, which seems like a lifetime when you look at global politics, in particular global climate politics, but still, to make you all melancholic, I put a picture of it up there. Um, what it basically means is um, that the range that John Shell, who has showed us, has been apparently discussed, or obviously discussed since decades, has finally found its way into a, a legally binding agreement. Um, and now the question and challenges to us, obviously, is how do we understand that? And knowing that already 10 years ago, it was basically a range between one and a half and two and a half degrees that were kind of felt as being the uh, focal point of the debate, you can argue that the scientific community has been a bit slow in waking up to that call, in particularly also since vulnerable countries like small island states and least developed countries have been calling for a one and a half degree temperature limit already since 2008. Uh, however, now it has become a hot topic in the scientific community. And there are a lot of interesting questions around that. How to interpret it? For which impacts a global mean temperature level is actually a good indicator? For which impact it is not? How do time delays play into the game? How do other factors like atmospheric composition and CO2 fertilization effect that was just mentioned in the question play into this? And how do they differ between 2030 or 2100 or, for example, after a temperature overshoot? Is one and a half, uh, after, after reaching 1.7 the same or in which systems will have a memory or which systems will probably have gone extinct in the meantime? However, what it is not, and uh, I want to stress this point a little bit, it is there's little ambiguity of what it actually means and how it's understood in the political process. Uh, and it, it refers to long-term global mean temperature changes that exclude natural variability. And the reason why I want to stress this point, and I'm quite obviously speaking to the, uh, to the converted here, is that there have been lots of studies from the scientific community rushing to address this question that were relating global temperature limits like one and a half degrees to regional temperature changes, to land only, or to uh, actually factors including natural variability. So linking studies that include um, modes of natural variability like Pacific decadal oscillation to global long-term mean temperature targets. And this matches a lot. And I hope I can convince you in the next few minutes that getting this right is really important to also get our message across. Because what temperature limits eventually are, they are the focal points of our debate that allow us to um, link the risk assessments that we do in the climate impacts community to uh, the mitigation efforts that have to be done to get us there. So eventually, a carbon budget. And what it means is the very nature of a mean temperature target. It means it will be exceeded every second year once we're there. Um, so if you now take the viewpoint that we care about annual global mean temperature, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say we, are, we really care about that. We don't want to have it exceeded every second year, but with a slightly lower probability. So one in five years, one in 10, or one in 20. Well, it's quite obvious that the curve moves to the left, so the global mean temperature needs to go down. And this means that the carbon budget available to achieve this target goes down as well. And if you go for one in 20 years, this is probably equivalent to 10 years of 2015 global CO2 emissions. So it's a huge difference that we're talking about there. And if you would say we don't want 1.5 to be exceeded in any given year, we are actually there. Um, so the global carbon budget would be exceeded and we are around one degree now and this is the limit that we would need if you don't want to see any single year above that threshold. So this is quite fundamental because when we communicate 
to policymakers, all with our colleagues in other disciplines, getting this right matters a lot. And I hope I could convince you of that, and I'll move on to the next thing, which is actually about discriminating levels of global mean temperature. And it's again a very fascinating question, and I alluded a bit on this earlier, but I, again I want to put up two main questions that may be interesting to discuss also in the realms of this conference. And one is, do we have reason to believe that there will be a difference between one and a half and two? And the other one is, do we have the means to detect the differences? Which are two very distinct questions, and all the modelers of you, uh, uh, here actually know this very well. There are big challenges relating to our tools that we have, and particularly when discriminating such fine differences. Um, but we have additional evidence that we can look at what a half a degree temperature difference could actually mean, and this comes from the observational record. We all know that we are roughly about one degree of warming, and that we can actually look back and see what half a degree did to us. And interestingly, the period for which we, most of our records we're actually having, dating back to the 1950s, few of them date back earlier, but that's basically the range we're talking about, this is about half a degree of warming. So we can look at what half a degree of warming did in the past, and we did that. Uh, for temperature extremes, and uh, these are the results, so basically the shaded areas are what you would expect from natural variability alone, and you can see a very distinct signal, which shouldn't surprise anyone, because that's basically what reported in the IPCC World Group 1 report, that uh, for a range of um, temperature as well as precipitation extremes, you solidly move out of the range of natural variability. So there's some solid indication there that actually half a degree matters. Um, but we have more knowledge, obviously, on that. And uh, we have compiled a lot of knowledge, for example, in the uh, last assessment report on at observed and attributable impacts uh, in, the, um, in many sectors, including physical, biological, and human systems. Some of them where we don't even have quantitative models to project the future. So we, the only thing we have is actually looking back to the past and trying to relate potential future changes to changes in the past related to global mean temperature. And you see there's a wealth of information there and a wealth of confidence that we can attribute impacts on all these systems that we see to uh, changes in global mean temperature. And basically, most of them relate to temperature changes that are smaller or just about half a degree. And the last thing I want to say on that is basically that knowing the dynamics of our systems, and we've seen a few nonlinear responses already today, for example, also in the health sector this morning, um, this will likely be a lower bound. We are moving outside the range of natural variability. This forcing on these systems continues to increase, and therefore, we, in many systems, will likely expect bigger impacts from additional half a degree warming increments that we have seen in the past. So how does this now compare with the tools that we have. So now overlaid is the range of CMIP-5 uh, uh, model projections for half a degree warming over the observational period uh, with this there. Some differences there, and I could go on for a long time about where these differences are coming from, and I think they're very exciting, and it's an exciting research topic. I'll spare you uh, for the minute. And we can even see how it changes in the future. So now overlaid in gray is the difference between one and a half and two. Again, not perfect agreement. We didn't expect that. There are a few changes, but we can be reasonably confident that for these indicators specifically, which is extreme temperature uh, here and uh, extreme precipitation, that there, the past is a good indicator of what we probably will see in the future. But there's an important element there when you just think, okay, this will be a linear process. And this is about thresholds. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, and obviously this is highly relevant in particular for sectorial impacts where systemic thresholds may exist that uh, relate to uh, species extinction or even in the health sector to productivity or very strong nonlinear responses. And this is just again an example from extreme event analysis showing the probability of exceeding uh, daily temperature extremes from the pre-industrial period by Fisher and Reto Knutti from the ETH series. And um, it basically shows the blue curve is one in a hundred year extreme, the red curve is a uh, day's extreme, pardon me, and the red curve is a one in a thousand day extreme. And it goes up very, very rapidly, non-linearly, and strongly between one and a half and two. And relating back to what we learned this morning, that in the tropics, heat stress already is a really, really challenging issue. If you're going towards a two degree world, actually, what would now would be a very unusual heat wave would become kind of the new normal there. Uh, in particular, as natural variability, present day and past natural variability, is comparably low, thereby pushing us out of this range. Results from one sector, and you all very well know that basically global results are all, never uniform, and this is an important aspect to bear in mind when discriminating impacts at half a degree warming levels. This is annual water availability uh, for one and a half and two degrees from the Izmir fast track. You see some regions are actually getting more water, some are less. 
And actually, I want to zoom in on one particular one, because the Mediterranean is in a basin that's already particularly affected by drying trends, and it will continue to do so, and even increase non-linearly between one and a half and two degrees. Um, this is an important hotspot of climate change differences, and there are a few more around the globe, and I guess we'll learn about, more about this over the next days here at the conference. Um, there have been way more other impacts we've in preliminary analysis looked into, and there will be way more coming forward for the one and a half to be special report of the IPCC. Just to mention a few, extreme precipitation is going up, but also regional, strong regional differences in that. For coral reefs, as we learned this morning already in a talk from uh, John Schellenhuber, this might be the decisive difference. So limiting warming to one and a half degrees may give us some chance of preserving some of these unique and threatened systems where going to two will, with uh, unfortunately high certainty, doom those. Um, there's also impacts on tropical agricultural yields that we've looked into, and we heard, again, that basically it's long been common knowledge that tropical regions will be affected substantially, and this is the same for one and a half and twos, although obviously uncertainties are substantial and depend on crop type. To sum up, um, I think, I hope I could convince you that actually being on track what a global mean temperature limit level is is important, and that uh, our understanding of a one and a half degree world needs to be further developed, but it's an exciting research topic. And I want to start with a few takeaway messages. So one is about the hotspots. There will be dif different regions will be affected differently, and for some it will matter more, and for some it will matter less. Um, I've mentioned a few, I haven't mentioned another region, obviously the polar regions, for, this, for, uh, for them the difference between one and a half and two matters strongly. So there's uh, evidence mounting that uh, for a warming exceeding one and a half degrees, we are looking into a much increased probability of actually uh, an ice-free Arctic in summer. And just another anecdote to Friedrich Nansen, who featured so prominently this morning, he also attempted to ski to the North Pole. Uh, so in an exceeding one and a half degree world, he could actually take a canoe. I'm not sure he would like that, but I'm just uh, uh, wanted to pass that anecdote on. So there's a lot of drastic change going on between one and a half and two. We also need specific modeling protocols to really look into these differences. So for example, looking into the tails of distributions, because we know that in the extreme events, this is where we probably see the biggest differences. Fortunately, there are lots of attempts underway. One is, for example, the Harvard V Prediction, Prediction uh, and Impact Initiative, HAPI, uh, where first results for the water and agriculture sector are also uh, available and will be presented here at the conference. And certain, uh, uh, certainly not least, and apologies for that, um, we will look into abrupt shifts and tipping points much more than we have done so be, uh, before. We've seen this plot uh, in the presentation by John Schellenhuber about this range and about the risks increasing between one and a half and two. We need to be much better on that. We need to understand where these thresholds exactly lie and what exceedance of these thresholds for the system dynamics really mean, because obviously we are approaching the danger zone there. Um, and this relates then obviously and this is important for the linkages with the impact community and the mitigation community uh, to pathway dependencies, because what they would do is analyze global emission pathways, and we need to understand and relate our impact projections to those pathways and be a better able to discriminate, for example, an overshoot and a non-overshoot pathway, and to communicate clearly where it matters and where it probably doesn't. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Um, again, two questions, I think. Um, here. Um, sorry, this is the question from an ignorant perspective. I'm not a scientist, I'm an economist. Um, it seems to me that, from an outsider perspective, that studying 1.5 degrees is like studying unicorns. It's not a realistic scenario um, because we're not changing our, our carbon uh, emissions in any way uh, magnitude that will actually be this goal be achievable so I'm wondering what you can say about that is it a unicorn um, I, I, cert I would certainly disagree um, because it is something that is still technically and economically feasible and therefore it's valid to be studied um, um, that's what our technical and economic models say. Politically feasible is obviously a value judgment question. And the question is if we as scientists should uh, pre-assess what a value judgment should look like and say, okay, we somehow feel something is infeasible, so therefore we don't even look at it. We should look at it and we should provide the best science available, in particular on small differences, or apparently small differences, because it's not to, uh, up to us to do the value judgment of which 
direction the world should go. And if you ask a policymaker from a small island state or a policymaker from a coal state in the US, they all have very, very different answers of actually where they want to go. So we shouldn't, and we probably have done it too, for too long to just listen to one side saying that they, and crying out that they want to go that they don't want to go as there. We need to have all the information on the table and we probably need to do a better job and it's uh, where we'll end up. It's certainly not just up to us, but we should provide all pathways that we think are in the cards. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a bit on the same, here. Yeah. It's, a, it's a bit on the same uh, topic and please don't repeat anything I'll say, but uh, I understand we need to understand more than 1.5 degree target, but I would really hate to see impact research like focusing so much on 1.5 that nobody's looking at 4 and 5. Uh, we have been working on the risk in many countries and the big worry we have is how do we keep preparing for this non-impossible future which is about 4 and 5. And I think like looking at the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees really less important than trying to anticipate what can happen at five degree and, and how we can, uh, what the, the response to the fact that this is not an impossible Scenarios. I'm not saying that this is not useful. I'm just saying in the way, I mean, we have a responsibility in how we balance our efforts uh, not to follow the politics too much and, 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 and forget the, uh, the other scenarios. I think it's certainly not about forgetting other scenarios, but I would, again, I think politely disagree um, for several reasons. First of all, if we look into the near term and what you showed about 2030 is one and a half degrees. So getting better information on that and, and, and getting better information on the very near term and studying one and a half degrees, not necessarily is a contradiction. So I think that's, that's the first thing I want to say. The second one is you could argue what the present day business as usual pathway is, but my, I would take the stand that a four or six degree world, it's not anymore a business as usual pathway. Uh, the renewable energy revolution is kicking us. If we get to a two degree or one and a half degree, that's you know, obviously very uncertain. But we also, I think, on the other side of the spectrum, we probably not go to four or six. And then it's the question, if the range, as we've seen in John Sheldon, who was talked this morning, since 10 years is maybe between one and a half and two and a half, we may, see, we may need to do a better job in discriminating these subtle differences as they look in the models, because if we force them brutally, they all look much bigger. Uh, and at least having both in an equal fashion. I'm certainly not against studying a four or six degree pathway. I have just argue, um, Assuming what is more policy relevant is not necessarily up to us as scientists, but I would argue this is up to the policymakers uh, to decide upon. And there are scientific interesting questions in both. And there's the interesting component, component of attribution, so really quantifying what already happened at one degree of global warming, I think that's maybe also interesting. <laughs> With that, we are coming to our last presentation from David Bresch uh, from the ETH Zurich and uh, Meteo Swiss on the um, economics of climate change or adaptation to climate change. Thanks for the kind invitation to, to be the last speaker before, before lunch. Um, also, very much I like the, the scheduling of the talks because what I like to do is to bridge the gap between deep understanding of a complex system and provide more an actor's view or the question, how can it be we know so much about this system and act so little? I mean, this, this is really keeping me a bit awake at night and some of us uh, possibly too. And I think we should, we should deeply think about the reasons. The main reason is from my perspective that we do not have the same aim. So those who, the, who the study a system are mainly interested in understanding the processes and those who have to take action, decisions, have a mandate to take action, decisions, they are mainly interested in the performance of a system. So they're mainly interested in the question, do I survive the next day? How can I make sure I get re-elected? How can I make sure I can operate the infrastructure at a tolerable level of safety? These are the questions that drive these decisions. And often the processes, I say, are not the same. And often also, I would say, the system definition by itself is even not the same. So, does it work or not? We'll see. No, not really. So, I stay here. Um, bear with me. Um, basically, I think what this means is much, much more of a dialogue. 
It's not much more of data, it's not more evidence, it's a better shared understanding of really what we're really tackling and what language we speak each other. First, I thought, this is all about generating a new common language, but this will not happen. It's more to really understand what drives each side and, and how you bring that closer. And I felt probably one piece in that dialogue is that you underpin this dialogue with a robust systems perspective, and I felt therefore the open source is, an, is a piece on, on these economics, and I really talk about economics in terms of resource allocation. We just had it from the previous conversation, especially in the question side, where should we put our effort? Should it be more on the mitigation or the adaptation side? Well, you cannot basically say either or. Should we put it on one and a half and four degrees? No, we have to look at the whole range. We have to look at the whole range of options we have. So what I'd like to drive it basically down to is what are the specific options an actor has and how do these options perform under different scenarios. And scenarios here are not only the ones imposed by climate change, but far more the socio-economic drivers that shape our world. And that's also hope in that, because that's the piece where we and each of us makes a difference. It's not so much imposed upon us, but it's basically something we shape together. Now, you could say so, and it sounds a bit abstract and probably a bit philosophical, so I think it's good to look at case studies, and that's what I, what I brought with me for the couple minutes. So it's about 20 places on Earth we looked into different hazards, from floods and droughts to hurricanes to heat waves, all kinds of hazards. And then we looked at different economic sectors, so we could say a lot at the exposure side of things and how this is shaped by humans and how this is then affected by these hazards. And last but not least, we looked at risk cultures. And that's one way to talk about vulnerability in a, in a, in a different fashion. And very much I agree with Stefan since we know each other, the, the enabling piece is not reducing vulnerability, it's strengthening and supporting resilience. And resilience acts both on the exposure as well as on the vulnerability piece. You can move away, that's one way to become more resilient, or you can build differently in a place, behave differently in a place, and that can make you more resilient against some of these shocks and disturbances. Shocks and disturbances, in fact, is what matters to decision makers more than climate. Climate is a pretty abstract term. And most conversation I had, had many, in this case, as is many actors on the ground, normally it was about weather, it was about the recent past, and even more so it was about the near-term future. So we had the challenge how you make these things relevant for decision making, even so many of the dimensions don't really match. What we achieved is that, and I first go for the results and underpin then that with one case study, you see, do see that if, if you look at risk, and I should have said, we, we look very much at the risk lens to the problem, and risk is just the, the effect of uncertainty of on objectives. So can I reach my goal, whatever it might be, and what is the probability of reaching it? What are, what are the odds in that game, so to say? And what you see across all these case studies, if you look at risk, risk today, the present day story, the present day environment, is what shapes um, not so much only the world, but also people's behavior. And there's some, some reason in that. Next is economic development. So that mainly acts on exposure. And many places we go in to grow and develop, and that means we expose ourselves even further to some of these hazardous things like tropical cyclones in coastal regions. And last but not least, there is climate change um, basically aggravating that situation. And so that's basically the sobering part of the story. If you stop it here, you do not engage in a conversation with a decision maker because this is just a problem statement. And you need to provide some segue into the solution space. And the solution space is about options. Now, since I know how bad it might be and turn out, what can I do about it? And options are not only on the mitigation side, they're also on the adaptation side, but it has to be a balance. I mainly will talk about adaptation since we focus on risk here, but I do well understand that this is only part of the story, and that's why I had the bot with the three points in there, that basically all I'm going to say matters most for middle-term decision-making. That's the, the timeline you can talk with policy and decision-makers mainly, and it does basically assume some level of managing the system at hand, means staying in something like a two-degree range. Still, even so it would exceed that threshold, you're better off by doing that, by not doing it. And now we come to the green arrow, and that's the hope piece. 
We looked in many of these places, and we normally found you can cost-effectively adapt. It doesn't come for free, but it's much, much cheaper than sit and wait. And that basically means you can, most places, bring down the, the risk to a level as we know it today for the next couple decades, under all the conditions and, and, and caveats I mentioned. So with that, I'd like to jump into the case study. And we worked with a, a large group for more than four months in Bangladesh, in Barishal, that basically teamed up with local decision makers, the city planning office, funded by the German Development Bank, and looked into the issue. So we first gathered people to define the system boundaries. What matters to you? Where, where do you see an opportunity to, to make a change? And how could, that all, could we bring all of that together? We underpinned this dialogue with a rigorous modeling approach, as I said, open source. So the model is and can be operated by people on the ground at the end, and that adds to the trust in that conversation. It's not somewhere else you do something strange, and then you bring back a diagram. You can really play with that even during the stakeholder interaction. What happens? Murphy's law and the demonstration effect. It will fail. And I have to tell you, the biggest gain in trust was when people observed the model failing. Because then it became something they felt, ah, this is human. This is something that we struggle together. When we struggle managing the situation on the ground, and the scientists struggle to get the numbers together. And that bonded us far more than just providing brilliant results. Now, I said before, we look mainly at the climate resilient development story. So trying to combine the need for economic development, and I didn't say growth, and it's in different metrics than only GDP, let's be honest, and with the challenge to adapt to a changing environment. What we've underpinned the safe system with is exactly that kind of a model. Uh, you can look at that if you want. But basically, you quantify hazard very specifically, very locally, high resolution. You look at the exposure again. You go to the place and see what are, where are people, what are they doing there, what they care for. And then you try to bring that into their vulnerability perspective. So how do they react to a specific level of hazard? And the horizontal axis is often the intensity of the storm hitting them, the water level, whatever you want. And the vertical axis does not need to be dollars. It can be number of victims, it can be happiness, it can be something that matters to you. And then you, when you run this thing, you basically can look at the risk in a, in a mapping fashion, so chart it out in the region, or you can also use it for more to appraise some of the options I mentioned. But before we get to that, that's what it looks like. So if you run tropical cyclone in that model in Bangladesh, you have the, the small arrow where Barishal is, you basically convert the exposure map of where people are into how much they will be affected by a specific event. Now, this is not good enough. It's only one single event. So you repeat that for all past events. That's still not good enough. So you create a lot of probabilistic events, and that so starts to be a solid basis for decision making. And now you can basically convert where people live into what really matters if you think about saving lives. So you can run this thing and you convert the people and the flood impacting them in basically where the victims are. And obviously the victims are not in the city center. And that means also that some of the, in, that the options you might have in mind will need to take that into account. I say that because before we did the study, there was a city development plan basically doing river embankment and protection of critical infrastructure. Sounds reasonable, sounds good. It's not a bad thing by itself, but it doesn't really ser serve the purpose for those currently hit most by the, by the disaster. So this is the current level of flooding victims on average. So long-term average, about 140 people die per annum in Barishal due to flood. Now, we can use that same model and say, what happens? if things grow and develop. So we can put in development scenarios. You can also think about questions, what happens if regional climate is changing and how will that change that picture? And that brings us to the slide I had at the start, where basically it says, you have a development scenario which drives risk and you have a climate change scenario which drives risk. And what you see from that, yes, risk does increase. But then comes the question, what can these people do about? So the same model, and what you now plug in is your set of adaptation responses. I don't want to go long term what it means, but basically you then can look at what's the effectiveness of these options, say in terms of reducing the number of victims, and on the vertical axis you can look at how well are they, how easy is it to finance those. And what you see if you do so, you basically get 
to the following results. An early warning system combined with a good and solid evacuation plan is one of the most effective things. And what was primary, primarily in the sleeves is building program number two, a comprehensive program which does save a lot of people's lives, also in the thousands, over these 26 years, but it comes at much less attractive a cost-benefit ratio, very much to the point you made earlier. So thanks for making that inroad. So basically, it's just a ground proof of some of the part of that story. And you can also do that spatially explicit. That brings me to the end. Katya, I'm absolutely in time. Thanks. And not far away from your lunch. So basically, you can also do it spatially explicit and use the same as we had before, but not only on the risk side of mapping, but also mapping opportunities. And this is the crop that uh, the, the crop situation is if, if it looks, if you go back and use some of the crops adjusted to the local climate today and therefore even better to able to cope with some of the extreme heat and other stresses in the system, especially flood, flood stress here, because some of the crops they currently grow, they're high yield crops and therefore they are much more susceptible to some of these changes. What I wanted to highlight with that, if you do engage in deep dialogue with the stakeholders, and it's, it's weeks and months of conversations underpinned by an opening, open model approach, you do achieve at least getting that conversation going, and you can provide decision makers with a fact base to build an adaptation strategy. Because I wouldn't now advise to jump and do that. It's only one view to look at the problem, and I think one which as we've been proven, has been working in many places on the planet, and it always looked a bit like this. And it's on purpose. I took the case study where one, it's one where the climate piece is in fact a bit bigger. So this is the average result on a planet, but you have to go local in order to really make these things decision relevant. Still, and that's my final word, I'm very happy to be part of EasyMeet because it, you do need that step in between from the global regional models to make them relevant for ultimate decision making because all that this, this open platform works on is output from global models, regionalized and then embedded in a fashion as I've been showing. Thanks. Thank you. I could not cut the link to EasyMap. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, two questions. Cynthia? This is a comment, really. Um, thanks for the presentation. I think it's striking that you've brought up the role of cities. The, the case study that you chose to present, um, and also in your group of 10, it was striking the number of cities. Something that we haven't really spoken about this morning, but the role of urbanization and the role of cities as the level of governance that is actually right for taking on many of these uh, adaptation resilience development challenges, as well as even on the mitigation side as well. So it's more of a comment than a question, but I'm very interested in your views on that from, your, from the work that you've, you've done. Thanks. Thanks, and I have to react to that with two words. I looked a lot into, into how we can chart out the resiliency challenge. And if I have only one option to foster resilience, I would go for distributed governance. Means you have to give the people the closest to the problem, the biggest, at the end you'd say, agency to solve it. Other questions? Okay, uh, I come from uh, a country, it's Egypt, and I've never heard about climate change. This is the first time to, to, to know about this topic, but the thing is, what is m really missing in these countries, I'm talking about Egypt and the Middle East, is the education of the climate change. We don't have someone to stand and talk about the education and to educate people about the climate change effects and drivers. This is far too broad a question to answer. It's just a very valid comment. And there's one or two reflections that I can provide. I think one element is definitely a bit the MOOC type of thing. So there start to be more online material to, to kind of be informed. You still have to find that. And the problem is, in order to understand these courses, they normally would be at an undergraduate level. And that's, that's one of the big challenges. You really get back to the core issues. How we make sure people have the ability to develop a, a worldview which allows you to integrate 
these challenges. More than that, it's hard to say, and, and it's, it's, it's the core piece. And as we heard this morning, if then the nutrition level doesn't allow you to even build these connections, and that's not the case, luckily, in Egypt, but th th then it really gets very, very difficult. And, and, and there's no answer to that, just the, the big desire for deep education. I've got a very quick one. Martin Rokitsky from Climate Analytics in Germany. Well, in terms of appraisal, you used and showed the results of cost-benefit analysis, but we had a lot of efforts uh, trying to test for adaptation decision-making, trying to test a lot of other appraisal options that also take into account non-monetary values and, and so others. There was EU mediation projects and, and others like that. Have, have you tried to test others? Yeah, I mean, what I've presented was, in fact, the, the impact dimension was in people and not in dollars. And I would never convert people to dollars. And I think that's a mandate of a decision maker to wrestle with this challenge. What's my risk tolerance of people being severely affected? And that's, at the end, as we had before, a normative political decision. You have to take that. And then it's the question, what my budget looks like? Can I do something more and else? So what we had, and that very much these studies hinted to, at the end we always had a very deep conversation about risk tolerance or risk appetite of the different actors. And that's never expressed in dollars. That's normally expressed in feelings. And then you have to think what metrics best applies. Now, when it comes to implementing these measures, you often need some money to make it happen. And then it makes a lot of sense to measure costs often in dollars. And what I've often done at the end is have the things that matter to people in people's dimensions, the costs always in dollars, and the things that matter to people via infrastructure and assets and solid stuff to measure that also in dollars. And then at least you get relatively close to a, a, a consistent set of metrics. One thing I can say, and since I have the slides in front of me, I have to run them through, and it takes you only 50 seconds. So you have this problem, there is uh, future uncertainty, what's happening, there are emissions, there is... It doesn't problem. work, I have to go sorry. There. There's a regional scenario, <laughs> impact model, and people say, oh, it gets very difficult to take decisions. You, 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 you but can't no, see the, the slides. So exactly, the point is like, like this. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> that's, that's the answer to your, your question is, if you only we, take we one can't see it. so it's, uh, it's, no, it's a security there. mechanism. <laughs> no, no, oh, they're that, just no. oh, they're here. so that's what we need. It's basically say, if you frame the problem like this, it looks like this. But then, if you take other framings, it looks something like this. They're very different futures. They're very different options. What you learn out of these studies is. For many of the sets of parameters, you end up with a small basket of resilient options, which do make sense under almost all conditions. And if we would only implement those, we would be better off. Okay. And Thank you. Nice <laughs> final word. <laughs> Thank you.